Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Welcome to 2020. It is our first podcast of the new year, and... I'll share with you one of my resolutions is to make sure I stay at least three weeks ahead in terms of podcasts recorded. I'm currently five weeks up with one scheduled in a couple of weeks, a bunch of other tentative ones I need to firm up, but I look like I'm going to be able to, to stick with that for a while. Another resolution I have is not to post two episodes a week like I did a couple of times last fall. The second one would tend to get lost in the shuffle and, uh, Generally, I am hoping for a nice, stable 50 or 51 episode year with a, a week off here or there. And I posted all my resolutions in last week's podcast emails. And if you're interested in it and you don't actually get that yet, go to my site, sign up. You'll get a weekly email when the, the show comes out and you can go into the archives and look at past ones. And last week's is, in fact, 2020 resolutions. Now, before we get to this week's show, I have some news to share with you guys. First, uh, I'm going to be hosting a New York City area memorial for Tom Spurgeon, my closest friend and this show's biggest supporter. Uh, he was the editor of ComicsReporter.com and co-founder of Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, a wonderful festival in Columbus, Ohio. This event will be held at the Society of Illustrators on East 63rd Street on the evening of January 24th. That's 2020 for you time travelers out there. There's information about it on my sites, vmspod.com and chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Um, you should also just go to my Twitter feed, vmspod, because I've been posting a link about that each day. Um, there's an Eventbrite page so you can RSVP. I need people to RSVP so I can give the caterers a, an idea what the headcount's going to be. The upshot is there will be plenty of opportunities for friends and admirers of Tom to share their stories about him that evening and then to, to see him off one last time. Now, also, speaking of memorial services, um, there is going to be a memorial on the afternoon of January 18th at Yale's Battelle Chapel for Harold Bloom. Uh, that's up in New Haven, Connecticut. I only found out about it because the organizers asked this weekend if they could use a few minutes of my podcast with Harold from 2016 as part of the programming. Um, I was floored slash honored uh, by the, the request. Basically, um, I kicked off the conversation by asking what poems he would want read at his memorial. And after saying that he wanted no memorial whatsoever, he went on to recite a couple of poems by Wallace Stevens. And um, it was a pretty powerful moment. Apparently, the organizers of the memorial service feel the same way. So they're going to include that in the, the memorial itself. <sighs> Which is to say, anytime I find myself questioning why I do this show or having to answer other people's questions as to why I do this, or or how I'm going to monetize this, or what other purpose this serves, I think of moments like this, and that's where all the reward lies for me. Now, what sucks is Tom would have totally flipped over that news about Bloom and the memorial service. And when it happened, I... I had to rack my brain for a few moments to figure out who else I could tell this to. And there's my brother and a few other people, but, but Tom would have just, he would have just been proud of me. 
So with all that death out of the way, let's get to awkward social interactions. My guest this week is Emily Flake, the cartoonist, humorist, and author of the new book, That Was Awkward, The Art and Etiquette of the Awkward Hug, from Viking Books. Now, Emily's best known for her work as a New Yorker cartoonist, and while I've recorded with a bunch of people who have that, that same job, like Roz Chast, Sam Gross, Ed Corin, uh, Michael Maslin, and Liza Donnelly, Bob Eckstein, Peter Cooper, blah, 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 Emily's my first guest from the younger cohort, which means, of course, younger than me. But I was interested in, in her approach to cartooning and, and how she approaches a New Yorker that's that's got a big, you know, tradition behind it, but also, you know, a preceding generation of cartoonists who had really strong voices and how she finds a balance between, well, keeping the magazine's voice and still pushing the envelope, you know, because like her gag comics are awfully funny, but they're also unmistakably hers. You look at one and it is clearly an Emily Flake drawing, the sensibility, the style, everything is, is hers. And it stays funny. Now, at the same time, I was also interested in Emily's non-New Yorker work. Like, she does cartooning stand-up events, other live performances. She's done a couple of books, and all of which meant I was really glad to find out that that was awkward was coming out because it would give us an opportunity to get together. And then once I read the book, I was just glad to have read it. That was awkward is a lot of fun. Um, basically a pocket sized book consists of a one page drawing and a one page prose humor piece, uh, about different types of awkward hugs and awful social situations and the writer's, um, projections as to what some of these things mean. And if you know, Emily's cartooning, you'll get exactly why this is a perfect project for her. Her characters always have a sense of being, um, put off, out of place, uncomfortable, awkward, uh, basically. Uh, now, I, I did hope to get this episode out before the holidays because That Was Awkward is a perfect gift book, uh, but I had other guest commitments. So instead, I bought a bunch of copies for friends. Actually, my wife did too. She asked, you know, what should I get? I said, get a copy of That Was Awkward for this person. I hope you'll do the same thing, holidays or not, because That Was Awkward is a great way to signal to people just how uncomfortable they make you. I'm kidding. Uh, it's a really funny book, and it's filled with Emily's always out-of-sorts, regret-filled characters and some really, really fun prose. Now, as caveats go, we recorded in Brooklyn, uh, so there's traffic noise, um, and she was watercoloring some of her illustrations while we talked. Um, this was not as bad as the episode that will never air with the guest who asked in the middle of the conversation whether it was okay to take out her sketchbook and then just started filling in black spaces the entire time. In this case, Emily had to color some illustrations she had done for that evening's guests for the monthly Nightmares show that she hosts. Um, one of those guests is Robin Hitchcock, and that comes up at the end of the conversation when I realized exactly who she was watercoloring in. The fact that she could keep this conversation going while doing these absolutely beautiful watercolors just blew my mind completely. Anyway, here is Emily's bio. Emily Flake's cartoons and humorous essays run regularly in The New Yorker, The Nib, and many other publications. Her weekly strip, Lulu 8-Ball, ran in alt-weeklies for many years. She's written and illustrated two previous books, These Things Ain't Gonna Smoke Themselves and Mama Tried. Her illustrations and cartoons appear in publications all over the world, including the New York Times, Newsweek, The Globe and Mail, The Onion, The New Statesman, and Forbes. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, with her husband, daughter, and a new cat. And her new book is That Was Awkward, The Art and Etiquette of the Awkward Hug. And now... The Virtual Memories Conversation with Emily Flake. Although we didn't start off with a hug, um, you know, what awkward hug would we, you know, fall into from your, your categories? Mm, that's Is a there good one question. for itinerant New Jersey podcaster? Not yet. I'm, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to publish an addendum at the very least. I think a, a full sequel is in order. But where did the first book come from? Or where did this book come from? 
Um, so as it turns out, um, this was um, an idea that an editor at, um, are we recording? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this was an idea that an editor at Viking had um, because he had a book party for one of his authors and um, gave the author like a hug at the end of the night and it went so wrong <laughs> that he wouldn't even tell me how it went wrong, like what made it so terrible, but he was just up all night like going over and over this like terrible hug in his head. And, you know, being an editor, an editor, he was like, you know, this might make a good book. Um, well, and apparently... Do you, do you think it was something that was potentially inappropriate awkward? I ho I'm guessing it like was... Like accidentally it, inappropriate. It, either not, not accidentally inappropriate or just one of those physically uncomfortable things where, like, just your body doesn't do anything any yeah. normal person would want their body to do. But the staying up all night part is what... what. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God only knows what really happened there, but... Um, any thought? That's, that's for Brian Tart to know, and the rest of us <laughs> never, ever find out. Um, but so, yeah, I guess um, my own personal brand tracks so well with physical <laughs> awkwardness that, uh, you know, it was it was decided that I would be the best person to bring this to life. Um, so they kind of, you know, they gave me the idea and just kind of let me run with it, really. Um, you know, they didn't they weren't like they they weren't harsh overlords or anything like yeah. that. Um, so uh, I had a lot of leeway with what I was able to do with this book, which was which, I mean, honestly, it was kind of like the perfect situation because somebody told me to write a book and I wrote it and told you what and to they, write about in general. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it was the easiest pitch session ever. Cause I just, you know, I didn't have to pitch it. It was already sold. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was, it was great. But, um, you know, it turns out I had a lot to say about, um, both hugging and awkwardness. So, uh, so there you go. Yeah. Did you feel, um, bizarrely complimented that you were the person they thought of to, to do this? I mean, I like to, if I think of it more that maybe they thought I was funny enough to pull it off. Oh, yeah. yeah but I think it. really, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely some Monday morning quarterbacking, but I'm okay with that. And did you like this form compared to to other prose and illustration work you've done before, the, the sort of basically short single page and right. a, a, a drawing? Um, I did, um, in part because it made it much easier to do. You know, it didn't have to be like, I didn't have to tie together a long narrative arc or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I mean, I work primarily as a gag cartoonist, so I'm kind of used to short bursts of humor anyway. Um, yeah, like... The little little doses are kind of my um, my metier, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> Again, anytime we can make it awkward. Right. Um, I would ask about work process, but clearly you're doing work right in front of me now. Right. So I assume it's whenever you can get anything done. Uh -huh. <laughs> Is that the uh, um, particular? Well, I, I think of Sam Gross as mm -hmm. one of the first uh, New Yorker cartoonists I, I ever recorded with who has a a routine that is, you know, psychedelic and weird in its, mm -hmm. its way. But do you have any sort of routine? Yeah. I wish I could say I did. I think my life would be so much better if I was the kind of person who could like make a routine and stick with it. Um, I'm a highly disorganized, um, and lazy person. Um, so I would really benefit from a regimen and I really do not have one. Um, this school day kind of sets a time for me. Um, and our daughter goes to our friend Annie's house every Monday, and then I pick up Annie's daughter on Wednesday, so, and she's got, like, a class on Thursday, so there are longer days that I know I can get more, more done, and I, on Mondays and Thursdays, I kind of have those designated as my writing days, and I have a, um, I joined a workspace that I've been going to, and that's been helpful, um, but yeah, it's pretty much just try to do the things in a timely-ish manner. Um, and I used to be really, really good at working at night, and I'm not as good at it now, and it's making me very sad because I'm also not good at waking up in the morning. Um, <laughs> but, you know, once I... once If I'm home, she wants me to do bedtime, and bedtime involves a lot of cuddling, and then I'm just like, I'm in her bed, and I'm tired, and half the time I just pass out. So, um, yeah, it's all... You know, that's one of the perils of parenting. They didn't, you know, they're like, you're going to be tired, but nobody was like, Hey, you're probably going to fall asleep next to your child all the time. Yeah. As a, a proudly childless person, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm you know, 
always looking on at that with the, well, when I get old, I'll have mm-hmm. no one to take care of me. But chances are I would have alienated whatever kid Probably. I had and they wouldn't yeah. have to take care of me anyway. So, exactly. Plus, yeah. you know, with all the money you save from not having kids, you can buy yourself a spot in like a sweet retirement home. So, and so I'd like to think. Right. right? But, but tell me about where cartooning started for you. Uh, um, recall reading a little about your parents bringing home uh, Edward Gorey and Gay and Wilson stuff when you were young. Yeah, uh, yeah. They um, they had a couple books out from the library that really made a huge uh, impact on me in a, on, in a, on a very young age. Um, Some they, would say too young. Oh, <laughs> entirely too young. I mean, they also had National Lampoon lying around, and I read that at a not there's no age. There's no appropriate age for that. You know? Really not. But, like, but that... Um, was uh, one of the first, like, things that I remember really reading. And Sherry Flanagan, like, uh, who is a bigger influence on me than I even really realized until much later. Um, Because, you know, I I read Charles and Bonnie in uh, National Lampoon, and then I kind of, like, forgot. Um, Because, you know, it's something I'd read when I was little. Yeah. I forgot that that it was so dear to me. And then, and so fascinating and weird and disgusting, you know, so, um, and then years later I was, you know, kind of rediscovering her. I'm like, oh, I've been ripping off Sherry Flanagan for years. Um, so. Did she take that well? Did you um, reach out she to her? seemed to, um, yeah. I'm, she wrote, um, an introduction to one of the Lulu eight ball, um, uh, compilations and I'm writing an introduction to a, compil- a long overdue compilation oh of her work. So I, I can't wait to see her. Oh like, if she ever goes on the festival circuit, you know, with, with this stuff, I'd love to, to get to sit down with her. Oh, seriously. No, she is, she is one of my, one of my cartoon heroes for sure. Cause I was, I'm a little older than you and similarly discovering national lampoon at too young an age. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah. I'm all for, um, people reading things before they're ready for them, honestly, um, because I think you kind of, it, that's what makes you level up. Um, my policy with my daughter is if she can read it, she can read it. So like, as long as she is actually able to make sense of the words, I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't do too much, um, oversight as far as the content is. That's probably not something I should say. <laughs> Just you're walking In by holding a rubber <laughs> Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah. Have you encountered any moments of e- maybe I shouldn't have let her? Uh... I mean, she's super into Harry Potter, so okay. you know, like there's some stuff that's a little scary in there, but th- there's nothing like super inappropriate for. Um, Again, you know. going with Crumb is sort of a, a baseline for right. Yeah. yeah, she has not gotten into Crumb yet, um, and yeah, I'm hoping that if and when she does, it's at an age where you know we can have a real conversation about what that all means. <laughs> or that you'll be gone by then and not have to have the conversation. Exactly. Um, cartooning heroes besides Sherry that you actually got to meet and melt down around? Uh, um, I, or at least exchange an awkward hug with. Right. Yeah. Um, I I did get to talk to Chris Ware a little bit at, at the um, event in Chicago, which was great. And he is just such an unfailingly kind person. I mean, we have met briefly once or twice before, but he was like, you know, he was immediately like, hi, Emily, how are you? You're like, your new book is great. I'm like, you have, re- why have you read my book? <laughs> um, and so we just kind of stood there and flung compliments at each other until we both crumbled and ran away. So that was, that was fantastic. Um, and I didn't, I, I couldn't even like, I didn't get into the line to say hi to Linda Berry because I feel like, I feel like I, I tack so hard into stalker territory already that mm-hmm. I didn't want to make it that much worse. I mean, my daughter's middle name is Marlis, so. Yeah. And you wouldn't want everybody knowing that she was your best friend. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to make everybody else feel bad. Yeah, she, um, for what it's worth, the one time I got to meet her, a uh, small press expo uh, a bunch of years ago, basically Drew Friedman shoved me into the, the green room at, mm-hmm. the, at the event, and I stumbled in under orders to get myself some breakfast and uh the only people in there were the organizer of spx tom tomorrow mm-hmm. jules pfeiffer and linda nice and i just grabbed a bagel and hightailed it to the far end of the room right. figured i would just hide jules came right over to start talking to me and then linda comes over and says jules i was wondering can we get a selfie together huh? 
and they do a picture. Then all of a sudden, Dan Perkins and Warren, everybody's taking their pictures mm-hmm. with him and uh, bringing him stuff to autograph, etc. But it was a realization to me that as much as everyone else had that vibe towards Linda at SPX, right. Jules was, you know, her next level. To, sure. To, yeah. Know, cause was, I mean, because fucking Jules Pfeiffer. <laughs> that was my um, thing. I, I pitched him. I got him for the show. I had to drive out. Well, we could record, but you'd have to come out to Long Island. Right. I was like, yeah, you're, you're Jules Pfeiffer, sir. I'll, right. I'll go anywhere. Okay. You. <laughs> yeah. Minnesota, so, you got it. Not a problem. You know. Right. So yeah, I headed all the way out to Sag Harbor, you know, did our thing. But um, but yeah, it was just wonderful seeing that, that sort of hierarchy, how everybody has, you know, some idol further up. Oh, of course. Uh, anybody else you melted down around? In, in the cartooning world as opposed to New York celebrity weirdness. Right. In the cartooning world, um, you know, I feel like because cartoonists are are generally speaking like kind and regular people um, yeah. well, <laughs> the cartoonists in your world i don't yeah. mean yeah. regular in terms of like normal but like you know they fit there into are very a... few like can't walk the streets famous right. cartoonists you know so um i don't have I melted down in front of anybody? I don't know. Probably yes, and now I'm forgetting. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> From the blacking out and falling down. A- on the exactly, yeah. exactly. You did have a friend who got to meet Bill Watterson and then realized in that moment why he stayed as anonymous mm-hmm. as he has over the years because right. no one else in this entire room knew that that's who he was. Right. Um, did you um, interview Ricardo Siri Liniers? Yes. Um, yeah, we did one at Society of Illustrators just uh, th- this past summer. He is, he's so great, you know, oh, and I mean, yeah. the level of fame he enjoys in, like, the Spanish-speaking world is like, holy shit, you are like a Fucking rock, rock star. star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was when I, I was introduced to him at a festival, and I was like, oh... Oh, you're that guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's really, it's great to see that at least somewhere cartoonists are goddamn appreciated. <laughs> but um, even for that, he f- heads off to, uh, to to Vermont. Right. You know, leaves Argentina behind. And, right. Uh, um, I mean, I'm sure that the wonder of snow will pall eventually, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. I just re- keep thinking of that B. Clyburn cartoon where, like, you know, some... Guy's walking down the street with gold change and fur and a couple women on his arm. It's like the caption is, out of the way, swine, a cartoonist is coming. <laughs> yeah, shove. And I feel like he's the only one. I'm like, oh, no, you actually can, like, pull yeah. that off. Well, it's a story I've told years ago at Small Press Expo. I was at a table at a bar with uh, Dan Klaus, Hernandez Brothers, Ware, Tomina, and I forget one other guy, maybe Pete Bag. And I was hiding behind my friend uh, because I was intimidated sitting at the table at the mm-hmm. time. It was before I got this going, at which point I realized everybody's Joe. Um, but a whole bunch of young cartoonists came in, just walked right by and mm-hmm. had no idea. And I thought, you know, this is this is your Mount Rushmore, guys. These right. Are the, without them, you don't have a career. You know, you should, well, career. You don't have an art form. Right. Um, but yeah, just no sense of... You don't always know what people look like, too, you know? I mean, there's plenty of, of people whose work I admire, but I, I wouldn't necessarily have been able to pick them out of a lineup, especially, like, before, you know, the Internet was everywhere. Sure. Um, you get recognized? Every once in a great while. I'm not, like, famous, though, so... No, no, but you've, like, you've, you've done appearances. Yeah. You've, you've had some more media than, you know, uh, yeah. a standard cartoonist. I guess so. So, yeah, every once in a great while. Um but I can I can walk down the street and not you know I'm relatively unmolested yeah. by the hoi polloi. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody's shown up with a tattoo of one of your your characters on a. Nobody's shown up, but I I have um I have gotten emails from a couple people who've gotten tattoos of uh, of a cartoon. Is um, there a particular fave or just? There's just... one where it's like a guy holding a noose and his dog is wagging its tail and the caption is walkies. Um, <laughs> And this kid got a tattoo of it, which was very <laughs> flattering. But also, I was just like, I would, I would have redrawn that for you. I'm so unhappy with that drawing. Like, I, I seriously would have made you a whole new thing. But, yeah. you know. It's on your skin now, dude. Yep. <laughs> His problem. Prouder of prose that works or a drawing that works? Um, like when prose, you, you... because I never feel that the drawing works. Never? Um, and I can feel good about uh, Writing. prose sometimes. 
do you want to do more long form writing? I know you do the the short stuff, like we said for for the mm-hmm. book of hugs, and you've right. done a little bit longer in uh, um, the New Yorker and American Bystander, our right. favorite magazine. Oh so. yeah. Um, no, I, yeah, definitely. I don't know that I have, like, I don't know how people make novels. Like, I don't know how, like, novel structure works or, you know, I read. Yes. Which sounds like a brag. I'm sorry, but. As, uh, um, at the end of this, I'll ask you what you've been reading, and that way you can you can humble yourself. Right. But, anyway. <laughs> um, but I, I do very much enjoy, um, enjoy writing. Um, and at this point, you know, I'm fine with it being shorter things. I also like, um, you know, I, I have, I read a bunch of like, you know, sketches and scripts and stuff like that. That is, that's a form I find easier to write in. Um, don't ask me why, cause you still have to build, you know, you have to build an arc over 22 minutes or whatever. So, um, but yeah, that, that's something that like. I feel like I have less baggage about, and I can also see it more clearly, like where there are problems and how I can fix them. Um, Is it because of a direct audience interaction? No, it's okay. because I didn't go to school for it. And so I, I, I didn't like load this thing that I like to do down with the weight of all these expectations that I would never be able to, you know, to meet. Um, so... I mean, it's entirely possible that at some point I will have just as much baggage about my writing as I do my drawing, but for now, there is less. Don't let me give you anxiety, please. Oh, yeah. please yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now that I think right. about it, I'm completely paralyzed. Oh, God Jill. damn it! <laughs> you son of a Thank bitch. you. You broke me. <laughs> yeah, did you have to uh, train yourself to, to take notes? To, to write down something No, it's funny? something I kind of always did. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I always wanted to... I always, um, I will, I always wanted to write, you know, to be a cartoonist or write jokes or, you know, um, so I always kind of like kept notes in one form or another of things that amused me. Um, but when I was younger, like one of the first things that I remember really seeing that just like, you know, made my heart beat faster Uh, besides uh, cartoons, was um, Janine Garofalo on uh, MTV's Half Hour Comedy Hour. Yeah. Um, I saw her, you know, do a set on that, and then there was, like, a... And I can't find this anywhere online, but I'm pretty sure I didn't dream it. There was a uh, Daytona Beach, like, spring break edition of that. (laughs) And she was on, and she did... So a bit, whole bit about Gerardo and the crowd just Rico Suave. turned on her <laughs> and it was electrifying. <laughs> um, so that really, you know, that really put, put something in my head that, you know, this is a thing that people can do. So I was cleaning out my, to, this is an awkward segue, but um, I was cleaning out my parents' uh, garage because they, they just moved and I found... Um, an essay I had written to my written for you know school or whatever uh, when I was nine and a half um, called "Me Myself and I," where I say I am a girl with red red blonde hair, blue eyes, glasses, and pierced ears. I like dressing up in long flowing princess type stuff, which I didn't have any long flowing princess type stuff, so I don't know where I got this from. Wish fulfillment. Um, like tiaras, but I also like being cool. I was not cool. I can imagine. <laughs> I'm definitely <laughs> named Emily Flake. That part's right. I really want to be a comedian, feminine for comedian. <laughs> I might also write books. I could live on marinated steak. I enjoy greatly listening to rock music, in parentheses, metal. <laughs> I'm pretty smart, only I got a B minus in math. Yuck. All in all, I am a very nice person. Um, so obviously half of that is patently false. That's because your the, life is full of lies. Right. I mean, the tiara is not true. I was also like, not cool. I'm probably not particularly nice either, but I definitely wanted to be a comedian and write books and, um, marinated steak a la my mom was one of the few things I would, I would eat. You know, when did cartooning itself, well, when did it seem like, I hate to say a career path, um, <laughs> <laughs> when, when did it seem like a vocation? When did it seem like the thing you wanted most? You know, I went to school for illustration. So that was my main goal, um, you know, in school and, and graduating and everything was 
to make enough money off of illustration to not have to have a, a day job. And by that point, I was thinking less in terms, you know, in terms of like comics and more in terms of being an illustrator. But about halfway through art school, I realized that my work got better reception if it was funny. Hmm. Um, and so I kind of realized that one way I could hide my deficiencies was by being funny. <laughs> so that kind of started to find its way into, into my, into my work. Um, and it wasn't until, so I moved to New York, I, I, I moved to Chicago after, um, after school and I lived there for four and a half years. And then, um, I would get, you know, freelance assignments here and there. Um, but not, you know, certainly not enough to live on. And that's where I started, um, Lulu eight ball, but that was never, you know, like that ran in alt weeklies. It was never going to pay the bills. And I realized like, if I don't, if I don't move to New York, I'm, you know, my light does not shine bright enough that people are going to find me here. I have to kind of go to where the action is. So I moved to New York and I basically worked a day job until I actually did start making enough money to, to quit it. Um, and by that point, let's see, I quit in 2006. I'd been out of school for seven years. Um, so it took a while to kind of like get to the point where I was making enough money off of stuff I did. But by, by then I realized that stuff I did could encompass a lot of things, not just like yeah, straight up ask. illustration. So at this point, like I kind of cobbled together from a lot of different, um, disciplines, which is great in some ways, because it's like the more things you do, if something dries up, you can concentrate on the other thing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, again, I feel like it's, it's always, it's just playing a shell game, both with your finances and once again, with your deficiencies as a maker of things, mm -hmm. like I can hide this behind this. Right. Yeah, have you, um, I shudder to ask, uh, I don't want to say gotten career advice, but you know, met with some of the older illustrators slash cartoonists about what you were talking about in terms of, you know, financial and, and career chasing, et cetera. Oh, sure. Um, I, I had a, um, a great sort of like friendship with, um, an illustrator named Ishvan Banyai. Oh yeah. yeah. Who is just, I mean, he's so great. Um, and he, came to my school and gave a talk. And then, um, as I was leaving, you know, like coming out the door, uh, I pulled out a cigarette to smoke it. And all of a sudden there was a hand just like lighting it <laughs> and it was Ishvan and we yeah. started talking and then I came up and like met his wife and his son and like, and he was very, uh, he was very encouraging. He hooked me up with, um, one of my first paying gigs actually for Playboy. It was just a spot illustration. Hmm. Um, and yeah, he, he definitely, he had good advice and he was encouraging, um, at the same time as he was very realistic. Yeah, I was going to use that term. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, I think I am paraphrasing, but basically he said something to the effect of like, you know, like you're not amazing, but you're a pretty girl and you have a good personality, so you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I mean, if nothing else, like, I feel like advice that allows you to not uh, believe your own hype can be helpful. Maybe that's too positive. A spin. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good message to take away from that. I think. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let me ask, since we were multitasking through this, uh, color versus black and white work? Um, I don't have a preference. I, I kind of, um, I enjoy both. Um, uh, yeah. Um, getting proficient at color? So, yeah, sort of, uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you talk about deficiencies, what do you feel you improved on over the years? Over the years, I think um, I, I have settled into myself a little bit more, um, probably both as a person and an artist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the things that I didn't necessarily have a facility for, you know, I mean, everything gets better over practice. So, you know, I feel like I'm a little less stiff, hopefully. Um, you know, I don't think I'll ever, you know, draw like the people that I really want to draw like, but, um, but you know, I'm not going to not draw. Yeah. yeah. Who are those particular figures? 
Um, Adele boy. Rodriguez. Oh yeah. Uh, I am a huge fan of, and he can do so many different things, you know, and all of them so beautifully. Um, Eleanor Davis is another one who like, again, her, it's her facility and she has a bunch of different kind of things she does too, but like, it's just, it's so gorgeous. And I like, you know, it would, those two, those two in Graham Ramu, I would like draw like, you know, if somebody was like, this is could your, give your magic them, hands. could give me their hands. Yes. Favorite format for this stuff? I mean, we talked about the, you know, single illustration and text, mm -hmm. gag panel, the four quadrant thing, the, the serial panel. Do you have a, a, a favorite? A form you, you prefer? Probably the four quadrant, because I started doing that with, with Lulu 8 Ball, and that's really kind of how I trained myself to write. Um, so, you know, these kind of tying things together under a central, uh, concept, um, that's, that's, I'd say that's my favorite formula. Um, I really, I like being able to kind of bounce around and, and do different things. Um, but my go-to is probably the four beat. And the least saleable of, of all the modes you work in or, or not? <laughs> <laughs> Necessarily, I have um, you know the the daily cartoon can can some I can sometimes get a four beat in there. Mm -hmm. the, the stuff I do for the nib is usually a four beat situation. That's true. Yeah. Um, you know, I stopped doing Lulu Eight Ball uh, a few years ago because, like, basically because the um, the the newspapers that used to run in more or less all went out of business, yeah. um, and I miss it. Um, and I sometimes think about like you know trying to resurrect it as like a patreon or something like that but um as i have made clear i am disorganized and lazy so that has not happened yet uh, i wish we were shooting video of this too just to, to show everybody the oh yeah by the way Gil, i need to to <laughs> take care of all this this watercolor right. <laughs> um do you remember your first publication publication um the first well, the first time I you saw your stuff in, in print yeah. uh yeah juxtapose yeah yeah um oh, sure. And it was for um, an article about female serial killers. <laughs> and it was, it was a big, you know, they paid in postcards, but I needed postcards. So that was good. Um, but it was like a pretty decent, it was like a full page plus like three spots, I think. So, yeah, that was right when I was graduating uh, college. So I was like, that's it, man. I have made it. <laughs> like, it is just uh, like from here on out, I'm never gonna have to waitress again. Yeah. Yeah, it was not true. Little did you know. No. Yeah. Remember your first New Yorker? Yeah, um, it was a a girl, you know, sitting looking kind of shamefaced on a chair, and her father saying, um, "I'm not disappointed. I'm just very, very mad." <laughs> so you know, classic switcheroo. Yeah, um, but it um, works. Yeah. yeah. Did you write that also, or was it simply just the drawing and they they? Oh yeah, I wrote that. Yeah, I yeah, assume, yeah. assume, but you know, I never know yeah. with some New Yorker cartoonists. It's no, I just drew something. No, they, they... I, I really don't like drawing other people's jokes. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I have had jokes pitched to me, and sometimes they're good. Um, but you know, and I have had things pitched to me by like uh, by comedy writers, and some like they're good jokes, but like no, I, not you. I don't. That's like, like the drawing is not my favorite part of this, yeah. you know? So I don't want to not do the part I like better gotcha. and do the part that I don't like as much. So yeah. did you, um, do you have a massive gap between first and second New Yorker? Like Ed Corrin tells a story of selling his very first. Right. And then 18 months went by before he managed to sell <laughs> the second one. But. Um, I don't think it was massive. I think it was a uh, couple months maybe. Yeah, it wasn't like dishearteningly large, but I knew not to expect to be in there all the time. Hmm. Does look day get any easier? Even well, on contract, but you know. I mean, it's always like kind of like, oh God, oh God, oh God, what am I going to, you know, what am I going to send? What am I going to do? Um, I don't, I rarely go in. Um, yeah, you just you know because once once they once you can send things via email, why yeah. would you put on pants? Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's it, it's not like you know I don't I don't subject myself to the pitiless gaze 
of um, this by the way is not what i wear on a day-to-day basis working right. at home i just, right. just you know it's, it's usually sweats and a ratty cardigan right so, yeah. right um well, well you, you clean up nicely well thank done you. You know. um <laughs> So, um, but you know, but the pressure is, is always, is always there. Um, and it, like with anything, you know, I mean, it's like, there's, there's a lot of pitching involved with what I do anyway. So like, you know, whether or not it's gag cartooning or anything else. So there's, you know, there's always just like, a, all right, let's, it's a constant like running things up a flagpole. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think it necessarily gets any easier, but like I am pretty much immune to the pain of rejection, you know, um, it Which just means you're not a real cartoonist. Any, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Go. <laughs> I mean, I won't say that it doesn't affect me or it doesn't hurt, but I just, I have built that into my understanding mm-hmm. of my world. So it doesn't crush me to the point where I can't do it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well, it doesn't make sense because I let that destroy my creative career, but right. I have this, so, <laughs> Uh, but differences, there's uh, the, the changeover from Bob Mankoff to, to Emma Allen. Mm-hmm. Um, well, obviously not saying anything that gets you in trouble. Right. But, you know, just as far as different tones go, is it a, is it noticeable from your perspective as far as what you pitch or what to stays, a, what goes? To an extent, um, although they both really, you know, they both were in, they both are, well, um, Bob was and Emma is, like know that the the voice is the New Yorker's voice, you mm-hmm. know, and the New Yorker's voice hasn't shifted so drastically that you know, like there's been this like whipsaw thing between Bob and Emma. Um, I think Emma is like there are things that I had to explain to Bob sometimes just just because you know he is um, age gap because of the age gap yeah. exactly you know, and whereas with Emma there's stuff that's just more in our demographic wheelhouse because you know i'm older than she is um but you know we're closer in age than i am to bob sure. um so yeah if anything i feel like now maybe there will be some things that i have to explain to her because she doesn't remember them <laughs> <that kind of laughs> um but uh but yeah i think you know i think they are both like responsible stewards of that ship yeah um I mean, yeah. do, you, do you feel there are gags you, you could pitch now that you couldn't when you were starting out? Or is it simply just things that you found funny over time and better understanding that voice? It's mostly things I found funny over time. I didn't, I haven't really like, um, you know, they want, they want your voice in their accent pretty much. So, but I always, you know, I will often put stuff through that like just I think is funny because, you know, you never know. Um, and I feel like part of my, my my job there was to like you know push the envelope a little bit um i don't know i think maybe bob was amused by my general lack of house training um <laughs> so you know i'm i'm certainly willing to keep that up do you feel um this comes from one of your your peers influential in terms of younger cartoonists sort of doing emily flake-esque um, gags? No. Have you ever am noticed I? anything like that? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if I am, I am very sorry for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, it's a follow up. You know, right. do you have any regret for that? <laughs> um, do you think of, of long form? You mean like a graphic novel? Either a graphic novel or, you know, longer text illustrated. I know you did the, the Mama Tried book, which right. still broken up in terms of chapter or essay mm. but but yeah um graphic novel superhero but i'm just kidding but. right <laughs> i've got a wonder woman in the works and, which would um, be awesome um, <laughs> fat sad wonder woman <laughs> um i i it reminds me of your little mermaid right uh, uh, gag. <laughs> um i think if my longer form stuff would is more likely to to take the form of like an episodic narrative um you know something more like you know possibly more like a screen situation um but 
that said, I'm working on something that like, I mean, you know, I'm working on a longer thing, but I'm writing it as a script. But if nothing happens with it as a script, then I can try to just sell it as a graphic novel. Uh, yeah. Um, Fiction? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just wasn't sure well, if, if your life is memoir worthy. No. <laughs> That's what I was sort of wondering. I, I figured you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, well, in fact, tell me about the beyond the script aspect, the the performance um, part of your your world, the stand up cartoonist, the hosting, including this evening, right? Um, so, um, I the first thing I ever did like that was for John Hodgman's Little Gray Books lectures in two thousand three, and he asked if I would like to come out and do something for like this sort of you know variety night thing that he had, um, and this was when I lived in Chicago. Um, and God, you know, it's funny as it happened, I had enough like punches on my Southwest airline punch card to <laughs> like get out to New York for free. So I did it. And, um, and so I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I just sort of like wrote this thing to show as a cartoon and like talk over it. And that was like the first of these kind of things that I did. And then when I moved here, I started doing them, um, mainly with an eye towards thinking like this might help me get illustration work, you know, um, and not really realizing that I was kind of in the middle of like a real moment comedy wise, you know, like I did a couple things at Rafifi, which was like, I, in retrospect realized was like a big fucking deal in terms of like, you know, like this comedy incubator. Um, so, but it really didn't, like it it didn't occur to me until I'd been doing it for a long time that I loved to do it for its own merit, you know, that it wasn't about like, well, this is something that, you know, it might help me raise my profile in terms of getting some other gig. I'm like, I just like to do this like, yeah. cause it's fucking fun. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have any illusions that like, you know, there's a career in stand up waiting for me. Like I just, I, I Do you wish you'd pursued it then sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Because then I was young, um, and I had my nights free and now I'm not, and I don't. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there are times when I wish I had realized that sooner and pursued it more. Um, although, you know, there's, it's, there's so many, I feel like any, you kind of burn out on anything, no matter, no matter what it is at some point, you know, it'll be like, oh my God, why did I, you know? Um, so oh, tell uh, me, this is episode 350 something. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that said, you know, when I have the opportunity to do it now, like, again, I, I just enjoy it mm -hmm. very much and it feels very necessary to, what I do with everything else, you know, everything feeds everything else, both in terms of, of, you know, visibility, but more importantly, in terms of, in terms of joke craft and writing and just, and the, the, the desire to do something. Yeah. How different is the, is a joke on stage versus a joke on the page? Pretty different. I tend to be sort of more of like a, like, I don't tell like one liners per se. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times like I'll show cartoons and then kind of like go into a bit and then show cartoons. But like, as I'm showing the cartoons and reading them out, I have like asides and stuff that I yeah. do. So, um, it's, uh, it's a little bit more rambling and it's, it's, it's more like I'm dancing the joke than like drawing it. Yeah. <laughs> and is it, well, um, again, when you talk about how they feed into each other, mm -hmm. Those different types of humor, you know, learning and mastering each one or figuring out what works in this style versus eh, this would be better as a gag. Right. Do things occur to you on stage in that respect or is it partly the interaction with the audience that also... It's partly the, the interaction with the audience, you know, yeah. I mean, like kind of um, uh, working out what people respond to mm -hmm. um, and, you know, writing for for comics, especially, you know, like if I'm writing for like, you know, one of the four beat things is a, a different thing than writing for like this conversational tone that I take, um, when I'm doing a stage thing. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, they feed each other, but they're different yeah. animals. Yeah. That's what I'd wondered how, how very different it is to, to, you know, to be on stage versus, right. 
uh, live drawing on stage. Oh, God, I fucking hate live drawing. I, I was hoping. I hate it. Because I don't understand the guys who can do this. No, like Martin I... Martin was telling me about <sighs> guys who not only could live draw, but could come up with a gag no. on stage and draw it on the fly. No, I am so bad at live drawing. I mean, like, and I'll do it in a pinch, but it's not, like... That's like the I'm like I'm drawing this I'm like oh my god this is terrible there's nothing I can do he's got three arms yeah yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. which is why I'm glad that you're, uh, you're just doing watercolors here and not doing some bizarre sketch of me in the process right. so that's, that's you know, little things I can be thankful for but now how about the the hosting stuff like nightmare and and well tell me about them uh, both this and I think you've had other series. Um, yeah, so Nightmares is a monthly show. Um, we record it as a podcast, um, and basically I and a co-host, um, usually a comedian named Kat Burdick, um, get people up to talk about like kind of what's going on in their lives and then a nightmare that they've had. Um, and then I, uh, I present them with a drawing I have made about their nightmare, and they get to keep it and or ritually burn it. So, um, and I just... I don't know. I just always, I was like, I thought that would make a fun show. Um, and then I did a show at the space that it's in, um, which is a, uh, the red room above KGB bar in the East village. Um, and I was like, Hey, I'm going to try to pitch this to, to the booker there. And I did, and they went for it. So, um, I've you been doing that them. for about, sorry. You fooled them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so I've been doing it about a year. Um, and yeah, it's it's super fun because you know it's just it's just gabbing on stage, um, and then they get a drawing, and you know it's like a fun thing to do on a Wednesday. Um, and then the other show that I do is called Shit Show. It's a stand-up um, showcase that I co-host with um, Afira Eisenberg, and that we usually do at Union Hall. But that is kind of more intermittent time-wise. So the next one's not till January. Is that a parenting one? Mm-hmm. I won't ask about mining your own kid for humor sure. because it's something you've, you've done. Yeah. Mining other people's kids for humor. Hmm. Have you noticed something like when you're looking out of the, uh, at the schoolyard over here and right. thought, Oh God, I'm going to take that kids blah, blah, blah. And, and... I don't think I would specifically use other people's kids directly. Maybe like interactions between kids, yeah. but I mean, you know, I built my little comedy farm. I don't want to steal somebody else's comedy farm. Mm -hmm. Like, um, but if the so, kid does something hilarious, then. right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Because there should be no honor when it comes down to that. But are there limits in terms of? Well, what limits have you put in place in terms of what you would, um, how you'd exploit your child? <laughs> I haven't put many in place, and I'm wondering yeah. if that was not um, ethical. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you know, I wrote a whole book about being a parent, you know, in her early childhood. And I wasn't really at that point, you know, I wasn't really projecting into the future of like someday she will read this. And it's like, you know, it's not like babies don't have secrets, but, um, you know, I have wondered if she would uh, be, you know, feel like it was an invasion of, of her privacy or, or whatever. But, um, honestly, if we still have a society by the time she's like old enough to be truly embarrassed by me, then Everything it'll be a crazy. miracle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because anything in print will be underwater. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> Teaching? Um, You're I... Still, uh... Yeah, I teach workshops. I'm going to be teaching one at the Magnet Theater in December. Um, and yeah, that is also super fun. And also a thing where I'm absolutely indebted to Linda Berry for, because like her, her, you know, teaching techniques and ideas are hugely influential to how, to how I teach. Um, and yeah, that's another thing where it's like, it, it reinvigorates my desire to do things. Um, and it's, it is, um, probably the hardest thing that I do because like, you know, if you feel like a fraud <laughs> at all, then pretending you know what the fuck you're talking about is like yeah. that much harder. Um, but it is it is super fun. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, these it. mics aren't plugged into anything. Right? Oh, cool, That's, cool, You know, cool. this is right. all just an imposter right. thing. Oh, so. this is just a home invasion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now you've found yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't take the records. John will kill me. <laughs> but that sense of... Um, 
Well, again, I- I- imposter versus, you know, realizing you actually do know something. Mm-hmm. Um, what, was there a moment where you felt like, moment, what, shit, do I, I actually ever feel like I know, know what I'm, I'm... Um, every once in a great while, and it's a good feeling, but I feel like to expect that feeling or rely on it is, is, uh, dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I like took the whole Icarus thing way too much to heart, but I, I feel like if you, for me personally, I just feel like, you know, don't get too comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but. And is it more exercise based than curriculum based in terms of what you, um, yeah, you I mean, it's, um, it's exercise based and honestly, like, especially when, if it's like, if it's a longer class, I was teaching continuing ed for a while. Um, I felt like my main objective was to create space and give permission, um, to adults who had spent a long time believing, not that even so much that they couldn't draw, but that they didn't deserve to try to draw. Yeah. And that, that was a wall that I wanted to break down for them. Um, with workshops, I m- focus mainly on like joke craft and writing and idea generation because mm-hmm. in the space of a workshop beyond like a couple real basic technique things, you're not really going to get too much into, into the drawing of it. And I can point them towards resources, but I can't like teach them to draw. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's more idea generation than anything else. And like you said, the writing is for you. Paramount. Yeah. That sense of permission, was that ever something you struggled with? No, because I didn't really know how to do anything else. Yeah. Um, that gets back to the, when did you know you wanted to be a cartoonist? Right. Yeah, yeah I didn't really have a plan B. Um, my day jobs were were not career path things. Um, I waitressed, um, and I worked at a record distributor, which was, you know, which was fun, but, like, it it was not what I wanted to do like for the rest of my life, which is good because now that's not a thing. Um, <laughs> Don't tell your husband, for God's sake, there's, there's 10,000 records. Right, here. right. No, yeah. I know. I mean, you know, you can carve out a niche if you are very well organized, which <laughs> I am not. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that was, that was, that was kind of it. I was a pretty decent waitress though. That's something. Yeah. I never it's, really um, tables. It's kind of nice to walk out with like a stack of cash at the end of the night and then go to the bar next door and blow it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make rent next week. That's not a problem. Yeah. Now, um, folks, Parent. were they supportive? They Is weren't a- unsupportive. Okay. I think the general idea was like, you know, make do not make like well you are on you know you figure out a way to support yourself pretty much um you know i was very lucky in terms of you know i got a pretty good amount a pretty good financial aid package to go to school and i also had some money um from an aunt who like left me some like a little chunk of stock Mm -hmm. in a company that she worked for that ended up paying for a lot of what my financial aid package couldn't um, so that was, that was lucky. Um, but my, my older sister like had dropped out of school and gotten pregnant and, you know, done all this other stuff. So I think the main thing was like, don't do that. Yeah. And we'll more or less, you know, leave, you know, we won't hassle you. About the other stuff. <laughs> I think they were kind of done hassling by the time I was a teenager. And you're just second of two children. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because, yeah, the second kid thing, you can, oh, yeah. you can cruise. Oh, I mean, that's... that's Seriously, especially yeah. if the first one's a problem. So it really worked out well for me. <laughs> and tell me about your New York. What it what it meant to you when you were growing up, what it meant when you came back here, and, and, and what it is. New York, for me, I think, you know, when I was a kid seeing movies, I just assumed every city was New York. Um, I didn't grow up particularly I grew up closer to Boston than yeah. New York. Um, and Hartford is cute. Um, I saw Whalers game there once. Yeah. 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 You yeah. know, it's, you know, but it's, it's, it does not, it wasn't like a meaningful city to me growing yeah. up and, you know, New York was sort of just like it, this ur city in my mind. You know, I went a couple times as, as a child. Um, and it just seemed like this, incomprehensible 
like exciting tangle, you know, like fraught with mystery and danger. <laughs> that would have been the the eighties, which yes. were not pretty. No, no, no yeah. very yeah. much not. Um, yeah, like you know, a couple school field trips, and then my parents. Uh, so my dad took my sister and myself down to go to Bloomingdale's when I was like eleven. Um, and you know, we're walking along Midtown, you know, and this, so this was like 1980, I can't do math, um, 1988, you know, and yeah, just insanity. Uh, I, I will give you the better parenting story in a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, my sister's crying cause she wants to take every homeless person home. Like, yeah. um, and they were shooting squeegee men at that point too. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was a different animal. Um, and then I went to school in Baltimore and I, absolutely adored Baltimore. I still adore Baltimore. I think, yeah. Um, but I moved to Chicago after school because I knew so many people who had stayed in Baltimore and really resented it. Um, I think that there, especially at that time was sort of an inertia, um, to living there because it was easy, so cheap. I went to school in Annapolis and I had a bunch of friends who uh, that would have been that era. I was in grad school in Annapolis. So it would have been your undergrad years. Right. And Baltimore was the cheap place to cheap hip place to live exactly yeah and i mean i needed i needed more of a fire lit under my ass than that so um i moved to chicago with basically because everybody else i went to school with did and i you know i figured like there's got to be publishing in chicago which not really um a lot of sausage no i did not really do a whole lot of research um but uh, i moved there and that was uh really wonderful in a lot of ways, but I knew I didn't want to live there forever. I never, I appreciate a lot about Chicago, but it never felt like home. Yeah. Um, and so finally, you know, when I was 26, I was like, if I don't move, I really will live here for the rest of my life and nothing against Chicago because it's a great place, but I'm like, this is not my place. Um, and so I moved here, uh, 15 years ago. And it immediately like sort of opened things up for me. And it was, it was like, I was measurably less well off in terms of, you know, like not like I was making bank doing anything in Chicago, but it was cheaper and easier to live. So it was harder, but it was more joyful immediately. Yeah. And that made a, that made a big difference. And how's it changed? Outside of marriage, <laughs> right. child, and everything else that's part of the gestalt. Yeah. Um, you know, as expensive as it was here in 2004, like... A, a, I had no idea. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Like, an atomic bomb made of money has been dropped on this city, and it's it's depressing. And I say that as a non-native, you know. I'm yeah. not of this place. Um, and especially, you know, uh, a neighborhood like Windsor Terrace, which is very clannish, um, you know, I am, a, I'm a guest here. I will always be a guest here. Are you referring to my, my bearded brethren driving down the, the street earlier by my Hasidic? Oh, no, or, or no, 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 okay, no, 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 no. Like good. this, yeah. I mean, it's a, um, you know, historically Irish and Italian cop and fireman neighborhood. Cause I've seen a lot of Hasidim. Oh, there are a lot okay. of Hasidim. Yeah. But they, <laughs> they don't live in this neighborhood. Ah, they, okay. they, I think they're on their way to Borough Park. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, this it def- it's and it's ironic because I grew up in a mostly Irish and Italian cop and fireman kind of town, <laughs> um, but it's and this is a real segue, but uh, a real tangent rather. But um, I am attuned to the fact that, like you know, I am a transplant, you know, and I I try to behave myself, you know, with that with that in mind. Um, But, uh, you know, as far as transplants go, you know, I, like we rent, we're never going to own anything in this neighborhood. You don't feel like like the the gentrifying wave or anything? You don't feel like you're the gentrifying wave? We are the front runner cancer cells to the larger tumor. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, there's not too much I can say about that other than (laughs) capitalism and fucking sucks sometimes. Yeah. Again, there's a reason why I live out in the woods in right. New Jersey. But, yeah. But yeah, for me, it was always, there's one major main road out of town. And from the top of it, you can see all of the New York City skyline. Right. 20 plus miles away. And, and that's why New York has always been this 
you know, the, the model of a city mm -hmm. uh, when you get down to it. But right. it's one of those things I've always kept at a distance. Mm -hmm. I can come in and, and do this sort of thing and then bug the hell out. Right, and, and, right. And, and just avoid the deer and the bear and everything else wandering around <laughs> the, the, the neighborhood. But, um, as far as parenting goes, explaining life before the Internet to your kid, like, Ugh. has there been an instance where you've run into the, holy crap, I didn't have anything like this and my kid doesn't understand why I don't have that framework. Right. Um, not so much that I don't have that framework cause I, you know, I am also on, on the internet. Yeah. yeah. So, but there are times when I'm like, when I was a child. Yeah. That's my other like, thing I'm wondering. How different was your upbringing versus, oh, God, versus what you do now? Different in every conceivable way. Um, I mean, starting with TV, there's everything she could ever possibly want to watch whenever she wants to watch it, you know, and I was, three networks and PBS. Oh that's all we had. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and like my thing was the Muppet show, which came on at seven 30 on like Saturday night or Sunday night, whatever. And I remember trying to turn the clock forward to make it be Muppet show time. <laughs> um, and yeah, trying to explain to her that like, you know, you, you had to wait for stuff. Um, and yeah, she, you know, she's seven. So it's like, you know, she understands what those words mean, but she has no frame no. of reference for, for what a paucity of entertainment options is. Um, but yeah, but she is also, you know, she's growing up in a neighborhood with a million kids and like, um, and parents who are doing things that they intended to do, um, which I think is make, makes for happier parents. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, she's growing up in a city instead of a suburb, you know, she like, it's, it's a totally, it's a totally different upbringing than, mm -hmm. than I had. Um, I do feel bad sometimes that we have not provided her with a sibling and have no plans to do so. Um, she would like one. I have no interest in making her one. I was going to ask whether, you know, you would at least be able to do as a tax write off to get more material. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she angles for one all the time and it's just, it's not going to happen. Small dog, you know, I mean, yeah, like honestly, the hamster is going to have to hold her for now. Yeah. Uh, aspect of your own childhood that you could never possibly explain to her like crazy shit that you know you were allowed to basically there was mm. a picture of my wife uh when she grew up in in bayou area of louisiana with a raccoon mm -hmm. that was just in the house and you know she's just sitting there playing with the the raccoon that had wandered in and one of the two parents decided it would be cute to take a picture of that right. instead of, oh, my God, that might be rabid. Get yeah, the hell out of here. Totally. So, yeah. Any degree of the, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I don't think she she would be shocked to realize how unsupervised I was. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was. Uh, Go play in the woods. Um, kind of. I mean, like, a, like I was a latchkey kid for a lot of years, like, um, you know, and basically like we used to just play in this sort of abandoned vacant lot like all day yeah um and yeah there wasn't there wasn't oversight to anything close to the extent right. that that she's got going on now so um yeah i mean i i was certainly walking to school by the time i was her age and it was a much longer walk for me right. she basically just has to cross two streets and she's there but i don't think it's actually legal for me to let her walk to school by herself yet um so, yeah, definitely that is a, a difference. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, <laughs> we all talk about having survived our childhoods yeah. in the 80s. You know? <laughs> 70s and 80s. Well, the, the demented parenting in New York thing was mm -hmm. my mother going to the two-for-one ticket place in Times Square. This would have been mm -hmm. 1979, 1980, and leaving me and my brother in a pinball arcade mm -hmm. across the street from it, which, if you've seen The Warriors... Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> this is basically... Oh, wait, no, that's yeah, not The no, Warriors poster, but yeah. Before, but, but yeah, um, there's, there's just people on the nod. Yeah, Just, just sitting there on the floor, course. and Bo and I were just turning mm -hmm. on the pinball machines on and off trying to get free games. For sure, yeah. Uh, and it was looking back like, why and that did was she just think normal. that was... normal. Yeah. But th there, that wouldn't have struck anybody no. as bad parenting back then. It was fine then. for a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old to be no. wandering around a, a shooting gallery, basically. Well, yeah. yeah, totally. And I mean, you know, we had fewer shooting galleries in Manchester, Connecticut, but like we were routine, routinely like left in the car, you know, yeah. like... Um, you know, go like doing all sorts of things, uh, you know, by ourselves. And, you know, 
Um, one thing is, uh, Tug loves the movie Big. Yeah. Um, and it's it's funny to explain to her that like you know a couple of twelve year olds just wander. Well, one is a grown up, but yeah, you know, like yeah, they but just that, left but, their families. Yeah, and, yeah, like that really wouldn't have raised any eyebrows. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's 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 interesting. And also when we watch older movies and everybody's smoking, like yeah, <laughs> uh, my parents weren't smokers, but certainly there was n- nothing close to like a thought that you might want not want to do that in front of children. <laughs> As an aside, uh, the kid who played Tom Hanks as a kid uh-huh. uh, went to my undergrad. Really? Uh, I think he was about two or three years younger than me. David huh. Moscow was his name. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, my God. He got so laid. I mean, he was oh, just... Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Cute kid, anyway, yeah. and had the the, you know, the Hollywood totally. child actor background. That's oh. hilarious. That son of a bitch. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, was, it was good for him, though. That was, I thought that was, that was a weird bit of casting, to be honest. He didn't really look anything like Tom Hanks. No, like, but, you know, but... that's part of the It Gets Better uh, You're right. campaign. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, besides the potential script and every goddamn thing else you're working on, mm-hmm. is there a next project project? A next project project. Um, let's see. N- nothing particularly like solid enough to talk about right yeah. now, but yeah, just, you know, chugging along, generally speaking. And marinated steak. And marinated steak. Still good? Um, <laughs> my God. You know, what's funny is I can actually still remember that steak and it was not good. Like, you didn't it know was, any better. That's, oh, that's... it was like, you know, like very thin cuts soaked in like a one sauce per Worcestershire or something like that. And just like fried until leather. Um, but, uh, yeah, that is also, I mean, you know, not to toot my own horn, but like it's, uh, I am, I am a decent cook and my, my kid is really picky and I just can't explain to her the food desert of suburban 1980s Connecticut, you know, yeah. like where like vegetables grew in cans and cereal, like, you know, dinner was very often cereal. I'm like, you have so many options now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although my wife and I passed a Benihana in uh, suburban New Jersey a week or so ago. And oh, thought, yeah. That's a set. We were wondering if it's like dark red with paneling inside and all uh-huh. that. Just if they're trying to replicate the seventies thing with you know nicotine right. stains everywhere. <laughs> Jeez, that's a an intricate. I mean, bunch of water coloring. It, he's a he is a man of many patterned shirts. So I want to at least at least try to. Oh, this is one of this evening's guests. It is. Who I'm insanely jealous of you for forgetting, <laughs> uh, Robin Hitchcock. Yeah, uh, um, you should come. Can you come? I'll be recording two more podcasts today, and I've been up since three fifteen in the morning. So oh, it's so possible I I'll be right. you know, either that, or I'll be you know just zooming on speed at that point, and, right. and going and going. Right. How did you connect with with? So. Um, and is he, there a greatest guest you've had that holy shit I can't believe this guy is or this person is coming to our right? Our um, I let's see. Um, so I, we follow each other on Twitter. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, you know, I'm just going to fucking ask if he will do the show. Cause I, um, you understand that's how you and I are sitting in the same room, right? Exactly. So <laughs> it works. Um, it, it, it truly does. And I, um, you know, I, uh, I had a guest drop out. Um, and uh, you know, like something Robin Hitchcock had put up, like was in my feed and I noticed that he was going to be at the murmur ballroom like tomorrow night. And I was like, it's going to be in town. You know, it doesn't hurt to just reach out and be like, Hey, do you want to do this thing? And he said, yes. So yeah. Um, that's pretty nuts. And I mean, you never know. I might get like a text at like six fifteen saying, You know what? Like, I'm actually really tired. I'm not <laughs> going to do your... for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, he did a very funny Mark Marin podcast uh, years ago, mm-hmm. where I think he he admitted that basically every band he tried to form turned into psychedelic era Beatles. That like, right. he just had no ability to to really you know to, to make anything else happen. What are you gonna, was, What are you going to do? Of all things, that, that works pretty well. So, yeah. uh, most insane. I can't believe this person said yes. Um, I mean, hopefully it's not jinxing it to say, I can't believe Robin Hitchcock said yes. So, yeah. you know, hopefully yeah. that yes will keep on going into tonight. Um, and there's a cascade effect if he just says, oh, hey, I did this thing. This is really a lot of fun. Right. You know, or yeah. drop names. You yeah. Know, dropping names always helps. Exactly. Um, but next month, um, 
Kembra Fowler, who is a voluptuous horror of of Karen Black, um, sure. is going to is going to be on, and she is just like one of the few people that I have met who really leads a very uh, rigorous, crazy art life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm very excited about about that because um, yeah, she's. Uh, she is unlike anybody I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a fun show, you know, like, um, turns out everybody has had a nightmare. So <laughs> there's always something to talk about. I'll leave you to yours. Emily, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. And that was Emily Flake. Her new book is That Was Awkward, The Art and Etiquette of the Awkward Hug, published by Viking. It is an absolute blast and a great gift for the uncomfortable person in your life. If you want to passively, passive aggressively, um, you know, kind of convey to them just how awkward it is to make any contact with them. Anyway, you can check out more of Emily's work at emilyflake.com, which is E-M-I-L-Y-F-L-A-K-E. Dot com. It's got her strips, her previous books, prose, illustrations, performances, both stand-up and those regular nightmares and shit show gigs, and more. She's also on Twitter, which is how we connected, at Emily Flake, all one word, spelled the same way. And she's on Instagram at E Flake Agogo, which is also all one word. Agogo is A G O G O. Um, she may also be on Facebook, which is probably how she gets word out about those nightmares shows, but I'll never know. And after we wrapped, I asked Emily, so who you been reading? And if you want to hear her answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the virtual memory show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. I'll get the fourth quarter 2019 episode up soon. Uh, but meanwhile, you can check out the third quarter episode, which features an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Carl Stevens, Emily Nussbaum, Kate Maruyama, Leniers, Christopher Brown, Caleb Crane, David Shields, Don Raffle, Amor Tolls, Simon Doonan, Simon Critchley, and Sylvia Nickerson. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, blah, 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 and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at Emily's home in Brooklyn as part of a three podcast in two boroughs day. Um, one of those already aired. The one with Edie Nadelhaft uh, came out in December of 19. Uh, but that means $12 at the GW, another 30 bucks for parking, a couple of 275 subway trips, and a lot of coffee, as I recall. Now, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. The special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizik, Fred Kish, Annie Koyama, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Les Camella, Edie Nadelhaft, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Ottaviani, George Pfau, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, David Small, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Bort Thomas, Armando Veve, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. 
Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.